Well, that of course brings us to the technical presentation for this evening, which is by uh, our well-known Sean Langman. Sean is the owner and managing director of Noakes Group, Australia's leading general marine company with shipyards at North Sydney and Port Huon in Tasmania. Sean has spent his life around boats and starting out as a rigger has sailed all manner of boats from 49 at Inge's to piloting what rocket for an attempt on the world sailing speed record. He is one of the country's most recognised yachtsmen and has completed in 31 Rolex Sydney Hobart yacht races. His Team Australia Orma 60 crew currently holds the record for the past passage times from Sydney to Hobart and Sydney to Auckland. Sean can often be seen on the water as master wonner of the Rossman ferries at the helm of the Noakes-sponsored 18-foot skiff or racing his own Ranger 24 Vagrant around Sydney Harbour. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sean Langman. Well, thank you. I'm going to have a Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, look, it's a, it's a fairly... Is this, this the one? Uh, um, it's a fairly oh, punchy, right. fairly punchy title that that, <laughs> uh, that we've got here. Finite element analysis, computer predictions versus reality. And um, so, look, the opening uh, that I wish to say is FEA is a tool that uses mathematics. Um, some like myself work in the physical world, so engineers and naval architects. Uh, oh. Well, I'll, I'll be rambling and then you'll find a picture of me. All right, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, you, you let me know when you want to check. Yeah, sure. That's what I'm saying. You've got, you've got to sit there. <laughs> um, so out of, out of finite element analysis, which is a tool that I use in um, some of my abstract ideas of making boats go faster. Um, in a lot of what we do in boat repair, it comes down to working out what may happen, but moreover, what has happened. So as a, as a tool... It is used. We work in collaboration with people like uh, John Butler that's sitting sitting here. I think John came to defend himself tonight, actually. But uh, we work with John. Even today, we're looking at WP11, which is a very large police asset as to um, what's happening at the front of some engine beds. So there's a tool that I actually like. Um, this very, very, very simple. It's not, not a lot of my slides. Um, I like this very simple overview, which is we've got a problem. Um, we break it down into smaller problems. We solve that through, as I said, it's, it's mathematical equations um, mm -hmm. on the ground, and then we uh, and then we re reassemble it. And in my world, it comes down to we do a lot of trial and error, and we can flick over to the first slide if you want yeah. that. That that was obviously <laughs> an error that didn't didn't come through through trial as such, but it did come through FEA. Okay, so that is the One Australia vessel. I think um, the humour that came out of One Australia, the billboard that came out in Auckland the next day is what goes down faster than One Australia, the sign market. Um, <laughs> so that was, they used it as an advertising point. But essentially One Australia um, was everything that One Australia or the corporation was about or the, or the campaign was about was really the advancements in technology in Australia and show what we could do. It was headed up by John Bertrand, who won the America's Cup um, with Al, in Al Mons team in 1983. So almost 13 years later, they formed a new group and it was all about advancing technology. So it was one of the early monocoque carbon fibre structures. Um, these vessels are pretty much like a long sailing cigar. I tried just a just a Rather than um, rather than a round vessel, but essentially the load within this within the sailing boat is all about being. Uh, someone needs to go on mute. Um, <laughs> hesitate to. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe just say put it on mute. There you go. Um, I think it's someone that's actually listening in. Right? What? It's not us. It's not us. It's oh, not okay. Right. Yeah. So go back to the, the broken yeah. cigar. 
that one. Uh, that's the one. Okay. So to explain the situation, what what happened here? It's it's simply I, I was hearing um, you know before we started this presentation, um, some people were talking about when this bay is generally the engineer. Is what I do in, in my capacity in the marine industry is we're very open book. So we all learn from what our potential base, potential risk, and when those failures happen, what the lessons learned are. And it's about sharing that information. So in the case, if you Google the poor old uh, one Australia, if you Google it, they say the boat went out and the weather that it went out and sailed. <coughs> Oh, I was going to clear this throat. <laughs> Let me see if I can. Um, so, Chris Davis, if you could put his. Uh, it's it's oh, about this, isn't it? Yeah, so, Chris, turn on the. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, turn on the bottom. Yeah, no, no, no. Mute. Mute. Yeah. 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 There's Tim. Mute all. Mute all. Yeah. Mute all. Yeah. All right. Yes. A okay. bit, bit of luck, I'll get muted as well. <laughs> and it'll just be us. And we're all going back to the bar now. Um, <laughs> all right. All right. Let's see if we can go back to the front screen. Yeah. Oh. What time's the meeting tonight? <laughs> yeah, so look, in the case, in the case of One Australia, I've drawn a very, very horrible basic boat here, but just to try and show some low parts. So it was up or down so a yacht design that went over to a think tank and to build the lightest possible structure that they could build. So it's all about loads in, loads out, and what that would mean. The parameters that the sailors, the parameters that the sailors weren't given was exactly what parts of the boat they could use and what parts of the boat they could not use. So it's as simple as that. So to make a sailboat go fast, and we're going to talk about this when we get into my money thing boat a bit later. So what makes a sailboat go fast is Pass is, is actually the control of this one at the front, which is that's the view. That's the main side. What we do with the heat stay on most sailboats will govern how fast it can go into the wind and how close it can go into the wind. And the accelerator is more around this sail and changing its camber than it is with this sail, okay, with the main sail. So, in order to control this very front sail, what we do is we have Stop sharing. We the bit stop sharing. We have what's called a running backstay that goes to the back of the boat. So you can imagine what we've got is this load going from the running backstay through to the forestay with a massive amount of compressive force, which is trying to drive the mast through the bottom of the boat. Every bit of load when a sailboat sailing along is trying to drive the mast through the bottom of the boat. There's been some very famous uh, cases of boat sinking because of that problem. So in the case of One Australia, when it was designed, it was designed well and it was designed with all the engineering principles that was required. The load that was required to keep the forestay type from the running backstay was put into this FEA model and it came out with a certain amount of load and a load sense that they could wind that to. If they exceeded that load, they could have a structural payout. So what happened with this boat as I was sailing along and the Genoa winch, hello, Sean, and the Genoa, the Genoa winch, which is controlling the jib, so I just call it the jib. The jib winch that winds it on actually failed, it back wound. So they couldn't wind it on. They're in a boat race they're trying to beat the New Zealanders. So what they did is they thought, well, what's the smart thing to do? So on the low side of the boat, right? So there's a spare winch at the back of the boat, which is the runner winch that's not being used. So each time they tap, they change over to this winch here. So this thing is designed to have a certain amount of load that goes into this winch and a certain amount of load that goes into this winch. There's an amount of bending moment that goes through the whole structure, which carbon fiber, beautiful stuff, is uh, a word that um, the Bell always uses, quasi isotropic. So it doesn't matter where you put the load, it basically it dissipates. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> so it was designed to not have any deflection, not to bend, to stay straight, to stay rigid, that made it go faster. So the whole ethos of One Australia was to build a shell, carbon fibre shell, monocot, no frames, faster than any other carbon fibre shell in the world. And maybe they can build a rocket ship at the same time. So that was where their thinking was. So what happened with our lured trimmer on the headsail is he went, my winch is broken, what am I going to do? Well, we don't want the Kiwis that are off the track to beat us. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the other runner winch. 
So they took the jib sheet to the other side of the runner, they wound that on, and now we've got double the bending moment in the center of the structure. So what happened? Put sure on the screen here. Uh, if we can back to the first screen. Sorry, sorry, that's cool. We lost it forever? No. Okay. Yeah, so over to our number two. Okay. So we double, we've doubled the load. We've doubled the load. Um, if you, you can get this on YouTube. Um, they say it was so rough that day, there was no camera boats out there. Um, and what's quite interesting about this, and I say the way sailors are programmed is that even in catastrophic failure, you still do your job. It's programmed thing. So the foredeck pants still stayed on the bow and let the jib down while the boat was sinking. So it's quite quite amazing thing to watch. Um, and I suppose they're in denial about what was going going on. Uh, so she sank and uh, and was never recovered. So the wash up of that, because the whole basis of One Australia was about technology, is the information wasn't shared until a lot of time later. And it, it, rather than doing lessons learned, so that all of us could turn around and say, put a little sign on that winch, do not use. <laughs> if that thing fails, do not use, or the boat will sink. Uh, that parameter wasn't wasn't put on, so we ended up with a hush hush situation without the information being shared. But it does go back to finite element analysis it was fine in that in that case. It was perfect in that case. But what it didn't do is do a load case if something else failed and there was no redundancy. Um, so that's about what um, what we need to do in that situation. So, as I said um, earlier, and uh, for those that ever worked with Ben Lexon, he had a theory: if it doesn't, if it doesn't break, it's too heavy. Um, <laughs> and that is, but that is another way of approaching an engineering problem, right? So we call it in my in my world we call it flat testing. So there's a number of cycles that something will do. There's a number of times it will actually go back and forwards so it fails. So you can predetermine that. And then assess that against your final element analysis, which is the absolute most perfect way you can do it. Uh, famously, a boat called Safran had a carbon fiber keel and an Amoka 60. They sailed the equivalent miles of sailing around the world. Uh, so, sorry, it was a titanium keel. They, they, they sailed the equivalent number of miles of sailing around the world and they head off in the round the world race and the keel snapped the first night. <coughs> and it was actually the head engineer of Ferrari that said, if I had a component of my car that did a whole season for the next season when it became important to do the race and replace it like for like because I've already done the testing. So what happened out of that scenario, the way the, our industry works in the almost world of recreation, try everything, um, is that they banned titanium in, in keels. And for all of those Imoka 60 boats now, the keel and bulb is actually supplied. It, it's, it's, it's supplied to the whole fleet. So that took the guesswork out of it because of the danger of that particular problem happening. Um, we have the same in grounding loads. It's, it's the same, uh, same scenario. And we're going to get into that when we get into money penny, where um, accelerations are worked out on a certain length of a sailing boat and how fast it will go. That goes into a very old system called ABS. And then we work out what possible speed that can do when it hits the ground, right? So that again, what happens is you modify things as time goes on is it's reliant to go back to the modeling to see what the actual structure itself could take. Let's see if we go to the next slide there. You're the expert by the end of that. So um, I love that discretization word. It's beautiful. Um, so that's that's the mathematics, right? That's where you break everything up into tiny little bits. So we can go past this because everyone in the room here knows what FEA is, is about, but the, when we go down from defining the problem to actually, you know, well, are we going to use little squares? Are we going to use trapezoids? Are we going to use round things to, to find out what is going to work best um, mathematically? Um, this is where my world comes in, is defining the element and the stiffness matrices, because a lot of what I do in the rigging world, which has come about recently in Young Endeavour, is that there's certain ways that we've learned things over time that doesn't fit into a static structure. Um, so we're going to talk about that a bit, bit later. Um, the, um, when we get down to this point here of solving, as we said earlier, the flat test 
and validation, what I call the flap test, actually going out and seeing that is actually the model is, is correct, can only come about if you've got time to do it um, or you go back to being column long, um, long, long um, palpitations and then matching that to the, to the FEA. You can go to the next one if you like. Then. You're going to be an expert by this. Uh -huh. Ethics, my right. it is. So, um, SCS Young Endeavour, I've been involved with for this is actually a good photo because it, it explains something else we did. Um, SCS Young Endeavour, I've been involved with since she actually sailed out in late 87, um, was handed over in 88. Um, and at the handover ceremony, our then Prime Minister Bob Hawke actually called it Maggie's Revenge. Um, it's been a fantastic uh, ship for youth of Australia. It's quite interesting in that a lot of people look at SCS Young Endeavour and look at her as a SAR training ship, which she's really far from it. It's a youth development ship. And with that, um, and what has been um, our responsibility as, as ship's riggers and, and working with JB with some of the engineering aspects, what's gone with this is that it's not actually handled by people that say, right? Right from the actual commanding officer. We've had a few that had, but most most times not. Right through the ship's company, right through to. So it's it's run. Um, it, it's it's basically run by a set of parameters, a set of rules. So those set of parameters and rules we try to implement, and that falls really nicely into the world of final element analysis because then we can say if you take it beyond this point. You'll have a failure and working with the Navy that, that works pretty well because we can give them rules and they like they like rules. Um, so we actually replaced the mast before the world voyage uh, nearly a decade ago now. And that process went from the original handover of the ship. We can probably go to the next shot, please. The original handover of the ship back in 1988 and um, through to the world voyage some almost 30 years later. Um, the original configuration of, of the mast and spars had served the ship well, but there was an evolution from when the ship arrived, and that evolution did not come through any modelling. It came through structural failure, stress and fatigue, and doing visual studies rather than, than running models. So when the Royal Australian Navy decided they wanted to do a lap of the planet, there's only two ships that have actually, I don't, can't remember the other one, you may know, John. There's only two RAM ships that have gone around the world by both Kate, and uh, which is quite quite astonishing. And SCS Young Endeavour is uh, one of them. Um, so she's done a proper, you know, around the Horn and around the Cape of Good Hope. So when um, when it, when it was determined that she was going to do the world voyage and looking at the age of of the material and, and the ship itself, the area of most concern. Um, through fatigue and indicators of fatigue was the uh, the two masts. So we went through an engineering, reverse engineering uh, assessment and came up with an area of most concern, which was the sleeving detail. So these masts are made in two halves, front and back. And the reason why they've done that, and they've got a little joining lip, which is welded. The reason why they've done that is the actual physical size that you can extrude. Like we prefer them to be one piece, but we can't actually press, press the alloy that large. The sleeving detail, which goes back to when I started as a 16-year-old building masks, uh, was pretty simple. It was just two tubes, a piece of tube. It'd be nice if it was tapered, that's in detail inside. Uh, it'd be nice if it was tapered, but generally they're not. I was cut together and we just did good old-fashioned round plug welds. Um, for those that work in especially in aluminum, but these days even in steel, um, plug welds typically are uh, elliptical and we don't feel all we do now is we weld, I hope you can understand what I'm doing here, um, we weld inside the elliptical pole to the sleeve on the inside of the sleeve to, to join the, the two tubes and we leave that back in the day when we used to do them back in this era when those masks were made. We had a round hole and we welded them completely uh, because we wanted the masks to look pretty, we ground off the weld, right? And off it went. 
And then over a period of time, we got a little hairline crack around there. We just didn't worry about it again. Um, the, the better solution is always to not weld the two sections together and just, just tap them out know, like um, fasten. So put the same silk fastens in there. So in the engineering assessment, what we found with SES Young Endeavour, through the time that I'd worked on her as a rigger, um, we wanted to get better support. So when she was supplied from the UK, this four mast, which has got square yards, and um, had these what's called a lower and upper top where you know people can go up there and stand. And um, they were significantly narrower than what we ended up building. And what we found with that, other than our difficult to climb, is that there was insufficient support of the mast tube. So it used to lay off out of the side of the boat substantially. Um, typically, typically a mast is held up like a radio tower. Oh, that's, that's the deck, mast, spreaders, and seriously, the rigging. Um, the way that four masts is because it's got yards is that the rigging comes back into itself. So you get this unsupported area. Okay, so working out that unsupported area without modelling means it's, it's a trial and error situation. So we went through years of trial and error. We came up with a better platform. Um, and made the actual shroud angles significantly wider than what they were when they were first supplied. So the ship served us very well for a lot of time. When it came time to replace, we couldn't go back to the original methodology because this is now a, under control of the Navy. So we did an engineering assessment, which was farmed out to another company. And um, they came up with a series of areas that they were concerned through FEA. The area of most concern was this methodology of sleeving. And that's where we've we'd seen some airline cracking. So all of our energy, and then this is the reason why I wanted to talk about this tonight, all of our energy was so focused on that area and getting an engineering assessment that would deal with the sleeving that we lost sight of everything we'd learned for 25 years. Right? So we ended up with this beautiful solution. Oh, I like one. Anyway, you probably can't understand. <laughs> um, we ended up with this really beautiful solution, which came through the engineering assessment and the engineers that have never built marks. It was such a, a beautiful thing because we had these long sections of, um, of, of new um, extrusion that we, we'd done down in Melbourne. Um, and with that came another problem we'll get to that in a sec. But we had all these, these, these beautiful long lengths of alloy and the engineers that were working, they said, why do you want to butt through in these things as single sections? Why don't you stagger the joints? So we ended up with, instead of the traditional setup like this, with our, let's do another color, um, with our internal sleeve like this, and now we know that a plug weld is elliptical. Instead of doing that, Came up with this really great idea of staggering the joints so that we had you know a long a long section here with a section just sort of back there behind it. So we lapped like this, right? So we didn't lap at a single point. So we'd run one section through and then we'd lap halfway. So we ended up um, with a half sleeve basically instead of a full sleeve. So that one there's got a full sleeve, and this one here has just got a half sleeve in one side. And the, and the other pair of metal continues on. So that was fantastic. Um, the extent of the work that went into this to satisfy Lloyd's is that for the first time ever in the history of building a mask, every weld had to be extra. So normally the Australian standard, New Zealand standard is to use diphenetrin. So the FBA drilled into so far into the potential risk of these, this area. And from what I've learned with FBA, you can continue to drill into that area. Right, you become assessed because it's your area of most concern. So you continue to go into it, and you can actually make a hot spot grow if you want. You can. Um, it's it's just how you put the matrix in. There. You can continue to make it more of a problem than it really is. So what we did in this process is that we ended up with the most beautiful tubes that you could possibly build. Um, every well was purged, everything other than using using. Um, normal dive penetrant, everything was x-ray. And what got me is the Lloyd Surveyor in New Zealand used a magnifying glass to look at the x-ray. 
Now I can find a crack when you do that. So that's how far we went. And to the extent that there was so much die grinding and rewelding, I said there comes a time that our poor old 6061C6, which is a great alloy, it's 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 a beautiful alloy to use. Much you know, you can't use 503 in this 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 instance. Um, we got to the stage of just saying, well, you know, we, we did this temper so we could age harden it, but not make it a thousand years old. So we, we got to a point where we stopped, and now we have a system of monitoring. So we go back to the original potential finding the problem. The problem with these new masks was all centered around the wells, I thought. Where we lost sight, and this is this is one of the reasons why I, I wanted to bring engineers together and talk about the experience of this thing, where we lost sight is that our original section, let's say it was that large, it wasn't that a leak, let's say it was that large, our original section, which was made by Proctor in New Zealand, was pressed out of a mill in, in South um, Africa, which is the biggest mill in the world at the time, it was a certain diameter that they could do at the time. The largest mill now in the world is in Melbourne, right? That can, that can press metal, do a mill run and, and, and extrude metal. It's the largest. Right, so it's actually capital belongs to a superannuation fund. So they keep our money and they do good stuff. They do beautiful stuff. So in uh, comparison, the largest section that we could get done, the new die that we had done, is in here. Now, for those that play around with sailing boats, the beer, if you race boats in particular, live and you make the section, the stiffer it becomes. So. It's, it's the moments of inertia. It's how, how much it's going to bend forward and up and sideways. Right? So the bigger and bigger and bigger, bigger you go, right? the moments of inertia improve a lot. Uh, basic steel engineering principles is just make the, the wall thickness pick up. Right? That's, that's all you do. So what happened in this scenario is that we had, we end up with the same weight for weight tube. In comparison, if we had a wall thickness of that, we ended up with our smaller tube with a wall thickness of that. Right, so weight for weight, we ended up with the same thing. The XX, Y, Y moments of inertia were close, but I knew from experience that in compression, our smaller tube was going to need more support. So now we have a problem because we've got a budget, as you do, and the budget for this was quite astounding. Um, yeah, we're taking youth around the world and we continue to, to work with youth. And, um, you know, it's been a large responsibility. Uh, as, as the ship's rigger for a long time. So going back to where we were back in the 90s when we started to find that we're getting fatigue problems and we changed these lower and upper tops, we went through two iterations of those. Um, we went from aluminum to stainless steel. We went to 316 stainless steel, which you know doesn't have the most amazing fatigue properties um, with a lot of this load path that goes through this. And look, I could bore you for hours and hours on load. Is pockets. that just on the tops or is that in the master? No, no, this is the tops. Yeah. So we went from alloy tubes to stainless. The stainless. Yeah. So what <laughs> I did a lot with Young Endeavour is that um, away from the purest where you like things to move and bend on sailing, sailing vessels, SCS Young Endeavour motors into a head sea to get somewhere on time. So these turn into a pair of radio towers. Right, and and with that, there is an amount of uh, there's amount of cycle loading, there's amount of fatigue that comes into it. So basically, I've turned them into trusses as much as I can. So when the load comes onto this as a, as a sailing vessel, our main mast has this beautiful thwart ships rigging that takes all the side load. Okay, when the load comes into Young Endeavour, because we've got yards that have to turn, there has to be a gap in the rigging. Right, so we've got these panels that all sit individually, okay? And as we're sailing along in different wind strengths, we get a twisting moment. So the whole thing, when, the, when it loads up, we get a, get a twist in it. So it's quite imperative that those angles are maintained to support the tube, okay? So it's a, it's a dynamic moving structure, right? It, it, it has different load paths. It isn't something that you could just input one model in the in FBA. You've got to put layers of models in to get support. Now, as a rigger, all I do is say, we go out, we tension it, we finding that we're getting a compression problem. The simplest thing to do for those that sail things like stiffs or anything, you just say, well, I'll, I'll make the chain plates wider 
or I'll make the spreaders wider, or I'll get someone that's not so fat to be on that piece. So in this case, we wanted to change the spreaders, but with budget constraints, we couldn't. So if we see what the problem was there, because we've gone from big tube to little tube, and we're using the same bases, right? The whole support structure came in. So hence what I'm saying is that in the finite element analysis of those tubes, we built the most wonderful, incredibly supportive tubes with the best sleeving system you ever had. But the actual part that was holding them up, or we're still holding them up, the standing rigging is now under more stress. So when you get into that area, and um, I so said, I can talk for days on this. This started out with a type of material called North Lay wire, which is a steel wire. Over the years, we've looked at the modulus elasticity of each of these components and what is going to best serve this ship to last longer. So we have different types of wire. We have diform wire, which has less stretch. We have one by 19 wire, which has slightly more stress. So for a ship that's basic, um, we've actually taken some FEA um, well, and we've also then had to implement other systems with less stretch to actually keep the master stand up. So, and that's and that's where the practicality comes into uh, to doing that type of work. Let's go to the, the next one. Mate. Okay, so this is where JB comes in. We've been working a lot on this. This is the bow spread replacement that we did. How many years ago? 2019. Yeah, so a, a few years ago. And look, it, it was decided to change the bow strip. And there was a few things that came into play here. Actually, I don't know whether you can do it. Phil, can you go back one? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I didn't uh, realise another photo was one. Uh, one, one more, sorry. Oh, there. Yeah, so this here, and look, I love this because you see these young youth of Australia sitting out here. Um, there's not, if you have a really good look at that and you're into RHS, there's not really much holding them on there. Um, but the kids love it. The ship's company like it. Um, it is part of the challenge. We want them to come home alive. So we'll, we'll go on, we'll go on a few now, maybe. We want them to come home alive. So there was a few things that we decided to change. That's an old one as well. So we just go to the next one. Oh. So there's a few things that the mandate was when it came time, and it was really through Naval Health Surveyor, the number of repairs that had happened to the boat deck and the back, the back of the ship and um, this um, bow spit area. The, the number of repairs that happened over the years, we got to the stage, we bit the ball, we said we had a brand new one. So being as we are, we wanted to build a better one. So we came up with various, um, various problems. Um, and the first problem that again, both John and I got a little bit distracted with, the first problem that we found was that when we took the old bow spit off, all this shell plating here was severely corroded. So that was our first problem and how we deal with that connection part. So our fear, and I, I can't speak for what happened with the modelling because I wasn't actually doing that. Um, JB was doing that. So the big fear was that we now haven't got a ship in dock. We're doing it at the boatyard, which is great. Um, like I, I knew so little about how we would work in this area um, and I'm used to bringing up systems that um, when the Naval Hull Surveyor turned up Rob Skelton, I said, oh, my boiler maker, can you stop him out there? He's welding scaffold to the side of the ship. And he just said, well, how else can I do it? Right? It's a beautiful thing, to you. you just <laughs> weld scaffold to the side of the, side of the ship and get on with it. So, so, so we drilled into this area and we had to because a lot of these jobs that we do, there's a time... Um, limit of, of how you get it done. So a lot of the um, surveying of the shapes actually came about with the old bowsprit still attached. So all this metal here, which was an improvement, was all done in a brake press and uh, long lengths were done. Uh, and the closing plates um, were done in such a way that we could get full penetration, full welds, and, and just essentially come up with a better, a better mousetrap. And part of the brief was to make a better, safer platform for the, for the um, youth of Australia. So within that process, and I'm sorry, I don't have another, another picture of it. Uh, within that process, we came up with a guardrail system that is at regulation height, and just to make it really um, robust and stronger and um, to really be compliant, we put a rod rigging 
solid top run on it. So it's not a bar uh, because we certainly have some some amount of some amount of flexibility. So we built this thing, and then a few things happened after that. And uh, I actually brought this along, John. Um, so this is this is the bob safe pin that goes all the way. We can go back a slide if you can, please. You're gonna be an expert by the end of this. Um, so this pin goes down here, right down the bottom. And we'll leave this one here because I like this. Um, so when the ship first arrived, it was not set up as rigidly as where no, it's myself as, as set the ship up. And that's come about because of the type of type of usage. So it was a more giving structure, if you like. It had more given. So we've set it up quite tautly. When the ship first arrived, and for many years, this pin um, was made out of 316, right? It, it was, and it's not that not that large. So we did find a little bit of decoration. We know, we know it's a good old little whiteboard magnet. Um, we know today that this is a duplex stainless steel. It's uh, stab 2205. Um, and, you know, like, as riggers, we actually carry a magnet. Um, just to see what we see what we're dealing with. So, what prompted me to come and talk to you all and and to go through a, a, a series of lessons learned is that this pin was new for the world voyage. Halfway around the world, I replaced the shackle that connected to it. There's no wear on it. We went through this process and the indicator, and that's what we get the money penny. Um, hopefully, I don't run out of time. Um, there's a really classic example of, 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 an, of, a, of a fatigue indicator or a load indicator. So that Jacob is in a thousand times. So that's got a deformation um, where the shackle was wearing on it, uh, which is which has come to light through a process of elimination, if you like, of some things that were going on. So we uh, we came up with a slightly different sectional shape. As I said, that we were really drilling into this connection more than anything. Um, we were given a series of loads that came out of the original engineering assessment. And uh, within those loads, obviously, the FEA model was um, was run. What we didn't really figure on is that because we wanted to build a better mousetrap, we ended up with a more elegant mousetrap. It was a very chunky, um, horrible-looking thing, and we thought we'd make something nicer. That's OK, but the supporting rigging has got to be able to to take the load if, if you're going to get more bending moment. So from, and again, you know, JB ran the model, but we ended up with a compressional force down this um, truss, if you like, this beam that enabled the actual um, bow sprit to, to bend. Now, with that bending, the way I set this ship up, it's quite unusual. I call it a, a ship in the bottle uh, because we actually, Normally tension backstays, like I said with my blown up one Australia. Normally tension the backstays to put load through to the jib stay or four stay. And in this case, because of this very extreme angle on the uh, on the four stay, I actually do it all in reverse. And um, we go out on the end of the bow sprit and we tension that stay up last, which is not normal practice. The pre-tension that we put onto this this bottle screw actually bends the bowsprit down. Those that have ever seen a, a, a Melbourne cooter boat will see they're quite, quite extreme. So my um, philosophy as a, as a rigger is that we've got to maintain the greatest angle we possibly can on this bobstar. Okay, so bending that down maintains a larger angle on this, which then takes load off the supporting rigging. So what we found through this, um, through this process is the first time the ship came back from a voyage, I looked at our new elegant bowsprit and I thought, is that thing bending up? We didn't have prior knowledge of how this bowsprit would perform, but what was the indicator is now that we've got this rail, we've got a rail that goes all the way along here, is this top rod rigging going loose, right? So there's, there's our indicator, and that should have been the initial alarm bell. So the next thing that um, I did as, uh, as a rigger and some of the likes of sail pass would do, I just said, I'll just put a bit more load on this one. So we put a bit more load on this one. She went out um, sailing and we did have a failure of this supporting structure. Okay? It, it compressed. So that was good because I thought I was going mad that these things were going loose all the time. I kept tensioning. So we actually came up with 
the solution that we needed to upgrade some certain parts of the parts of the system. So what we've learned from the mast in that the supporting rigging has got to stay um, with the right angles. And in fact, what we call something staying in column, um, the actual structure itself was necessary to, to, to come into column. The FEA model in this case um, said that our structure was stronger. Now, did we break the load up between there and there under certain conditions? Um, did the Navy sail the ship within those conditions all the time? We don't know. Uh, so we had a elongation event of the uh, of the jib stay, and I did get their their logs, and they were carrying too much sail in that situation. So with that that situation where something came loose and we get fatigued, we get this motoring up wind, and then you know it can lead to a failure. So we're, um, we ended up being sort of somewhat removed from the process, JB. Mm -hmm. um, there was another assessment done, uh, which Lloyds came in over the top of our work and then came back with recommendations. The only thing I will say in that process is that, so we could all learn, it would have been nice to be sitting in the corner and seeing what validation they were coming up with. So the next thing that we know is there's an audit being done on the ship, or very, oh, can you get us up there? Oh, what are you doing? Or oh, we're measuring the size of your pin, mate. So why are you doing that? So we all of a sudden panicked that we didn't build it right. So we went back and checked all that. We went, oh, actually, no, 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 what's going on? So, oh, no, it's okay, mate. Once we once we work out what's gone wrong, we'll get you to fix it. Yeah, but we want to be part of the process. Because unless we're part of the process, right, then unless we sit down, we look at each lot of data, um, then we don't learn. And we end up with a situation where, I say, in this case, um, we're looking after the youth of Australia. It's quite important. All right, we can move on from her. We're getting to some other funky stuff. I'm not even following my stuff. It's not page five or something. Um, it's fine. I know that MCD spray want that back. They're not getting it. I, I quite like my paper paperweight. But look, I, I actually leave that on my desk like that. Um, and it's just a reminder. Um, and look, John and I have, we had, I said we had a conversation about uh, the FEA model on um, WP11 today, um, which, uh, you know, it's it's an interesting one because it's a very large, I love the word aluminum, so I use it, um, aluminum built offshore um, naval, uh, sorry, um, police vessel um, with very large fuel capacity. And I'm about to get into the fuel tank tomorrow because one thing I'm really keen to look at is the fluid dynamics and what the hell's happening with free service because they are very big tanks, right? And that, that vessel goes out to Lord Howe Island, right? It goes over the sea now. So, you know, I've learned enough about FBA now that I want to know about the free service effect and what it's doing to that bulkhead that keeps, keeps breaking away, which is something we haven't discussed. Anyway, so here we go. We're going to go into something a little bit more funky and uh, the main love of my life, um, which is making sailboats go, go faster. So we started out with this boat, which is now known as Money Penny, um, called Naval Group. The ideology of Naval Group, the, the sailboat, is we actually uh, tended. Uh, it was a French tender, and we got wind of the tender, um, it, sort of defence-based tender. We asked if we could put in a tender. They said, oh, you're a bunch of Aussies, um, you know, I know. We said, well, what's, what is the base of the tender? And they said, oh, it's approved that the French submarine builders and the Australian submarine builders could work together. And I said, well, you're not even giving us a chance. There you go. Um, so we, we were given the opportunity to uh, tender and uh, the CEO of the company came out and met me and looked at what we're about. And I said, this is what we can offer. So I, um, with a mate of mine, Josh Alexander, we went off to Newport, Rhode Island, and we purchased this boat. The contract didn't actually pay for the boat, just so that you know. Um, but the nice thing is at the end of it, I ended up with a nice boat, which I then turned into something else. This boat um, was unremarkable in its time. It was tried to make, the, the, several people tried to make it go faster. Let's have a look at another slide. I don't know whether I've got one out of the water, probably don't. Um, several um, several people tried to make the boat go faster. Can we go back to the slide, please? Yeah. And one of the things they did when they tried to make it go faster is they added four feet on the back. Huh? So, you know, waterline length is king. Um, center of buoyancy becomes a bit of a problem. Uh, but the big problem that happens under our FEA model is what? If we make something longer, 
the state, uh, any boat. It, it gets faster, right? So all that FEA modeling now has to be redone because the accelerations increase. So, so whenever we make a yacht go faster, we've got to revisit everything which is FEA and then we unpick the FEA. So I always get an FEA model from the original designers and then I start asking questions. And so the question that happened with Money Penny is that my job is a little bit like the Young and Ever job. I had to take 20 inexperienced, even though the French told me to won several gold medals, which wasn't correct. I had to take these um, 20 inexperienced submarine builders, 10 Aussies, 10 French, in a Sydney Hobart race, okay. and, and get them there safely and work together. So my job is to get them there alive. So the first thing we've got to do is look at this structure and see what it can do. So I asked a question to New England Boat Works. Um, you came up the idea that the bit on the back. And they said, oh, you thought that work. And then I said, you talk to the um, Gurit or High Modulus Engineering, and they said, oh, we ran the VPPs. So VPPs is a velocity prediction program. It doesn't give you, it tells you much better about the sales, fast it but it's not going to tell you anything about the loads. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, sorry, I'm just being across the room. Yeah. So when we got to Newport, Rhode Island, it was quite interesting because um, I don't know if any of you have seen any of those Fatal Storm movies, but it's quite bizarre up there. Like it gets that cold up there that if you walk outside, you will die, right? So Money Penny was sitting um, out of the water, laid up, and it had one of those stretchy covers over the top of it, or it was supposed to be there. And there was a storm event. Half the carbon fiber um, stanchions were broken, and there was damage to the cabin top. So that's the cabin top. You can see that. So it was damage to the cabin top. Quite interesting. This boat was designed as a center border. So this area here is actually a big hole. This hatch here, um, which it was uh, last Hobart race was actually responsible for me breaking my hand. That that big hatch, um, huge opening was designed to let spinnakers down in a what we call a windward lured around the Cairns boat race. So this area here, when we got to got to Newport, um, was damaged. So I said to the boat broker, oh, it's a bit of damage on deck there, mate. And he said, oh, yeah, he said, we had this big storm and, um, you know, the cover broke loose. And he said, oh, yeah, it's fairly super, superficial. No, no, yeah, yeah, I'm like, it is, it's like a bit of paintwork. Boat came back to Australia. And curiously, it had exactly the same damage on the other side, and it lined up perfectly with the opening for the centre board. Absolutely perfectly. I said, oh, that's, that's interesting. So I contacted the uh, original designers, and I said, oh, there's a buckling effect at the top. Of, I, I call it the top of the island, because uh, you know, basically everything I look at in this structure, and you'll see something a bit later. Um, that we designed is, is like a big eye, but um, trying to do like the good old one Australian and snap an arm. So I looked at it and I, I said, look, I think we've got a problem here. Can you run the model on it? And they said, oh, yeah, but that's, Sean, that's not, that's not, that's not the cabin, mate. That's not the structure. And I said, what do you mean it's not the structure? And I said, that's the outside skin. And they said, no, 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 no. All the structure is inside the boat in the tunnels. So along here, there's halyards. To go in these tunnels, these big box sections. I said, that's not legal. Is it? And they said, oh, well, no, 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 that's, that's the cabin. Those structures there. And I said, oh, I thought ABS deck, cabin comes part of ABS deck. And they said, oh, well, you know, ISO, and this, and this, and okay. Well, I said, well, anyway, so it's a TV indicator, right? It's, there's something going on there. So what we did is we ground it and we put what we call uni planks. So we put carbon fiber unidirectional and then one layer off axis. And we did that in house. Right. So off we went, we went off something. Um, and then I, I decided that this is prior to taking our naval group people in the Sydney Hobart race. I looked at the potential risk of the, the whole boat structure. This is the bow section. And because we figured that we were probably going to go up wind being Sydney Hobart race and the boat was going to slam, we broke up that area singularly with a composite engineer with finite element analysis. And what I'm getting to is that's a big mistake. We just looked at that because I said, I'm got a problem with the slamming loads of this boat and the bow snapping off. Can you look at that area? 
and you look at the whole boat, it looks a bit nice like. Um, which again, JB and I were talking about WP11 today. We've got to look at the twisting moment because aluminum doesn't like them very much. Um, we've got to look at the whole thing because we keep getting fatigue indicators everywhere, you know. So we've got to find out about the whole thing. So I made a mistake here in that we just looked at this one area. That area hasn't far and it's gone through um, a lot of uh, a, a lot of upwind work since then. We go to the next slide, please. Man. So I end up. Naval Group did their two years, and um, I ended up with the yacht, which I, I purchased for a contract. Um, it's a beautiful boat to replace it today. Um, it would be a staggering amount of money. It was built by a New York banker by the name of Jim Schwartz. It didn't perform, and he donated it to the um, Maritime College in, in New York. So we bought the boat very keenly. Um, I could never afford to own it. Um, but I ended up with it through winning this tender. And uh, and then I decided I really don't want to sponsor anymore. I want to win the Sydney Hobart race. Now, where the success of this boat is, it's current Blue Water champion. Um, it had a very successful season. It won Division Zero in the Sydney Hobart race and was seventh over, overall in IRC. So it's been a success. This frame that you see here, um, I don't know whether we've got another one that will show up better, um, but this frame here I call the X frame is directly below that big hole, right? So what we found is that the companionway is down here. This is obviously K over time. That's the, the engine box. Companionway comes down here. Just in front of here is this huge, huge gaping hole, which uh, is too large for the structure, but it's there to get spinnakers now. So we, we designed this in-house, and then we ran an FEA. And then I said to um, Thomas Bassett, um, so Thomas, um, Mate, can you look at the whole boat? And he said, Sean, what do you want this boat to do? And I said, I want it to last for 36 hours in six metre seas and 45 knot winds upwind. And he said, I can give you 18. <laughs> after, after doing the video. So I asked, finally asked the question, and he gave me the parameters right, of how long it will last for a and half. Now, if you're going to run a model like that, you, you, you're not going to take into account the helmsman and the road wave and all that stuff. So essentially what he said is that what you keep doing is that you're trying to make your boat stiffer, which is great, but every time you do that, you're point loading the core. So it's going to come to a core phase. So this is this is Nomex, honeycomb paper, carbon fibre skins each side. So you're loading up the core. So what we did, the same as what we did on the deck, is we went back and said, look, we're not going to decore the boat. Financially, it's, it's not worth it. Um, but what we would like to do is put down some planks, spread the load. So the same as what you do in your world all the time, you spread the load, dissipate the load. Doublers, in this case, is really nice because you can put glue down what we call a carbon fibre uni plank and that dissipates the load. So like when you do all your bending moments, everything you do in FEA, and you see when something is ductile, like steel, it just dissipates the load. In our case, we don't get the opportunity of carbon fibre. So our dissipation is, is really crash pads, right? So that we actually localise to that area and we say, how, how can we taper that load out? And then what we do is we find poor, unfortunate, another frame next to it that's going to share some of that load. Um, let's go to the next one. I, I can see that um, my mate's yawning over here. Um, this one. Uh, so look, this, this is where... This is where um, I've jumped into FEA with some passion and, and love because it's giving me the answers that I want, right? So what I said earlier is that you've got to be careful about it because you can turn around and say, well, there's a solution and not check on it. But with me, with steel in particular, um, and this is a beautiful piece of steel, it's called Bisaloy 80. Um, it machines very well. When Jim Schwartz wanted to steer this boat when he first got it, he wanted to be able to steer it in any condition. Uh, when I got it, I thought, well, I'm better than that bloke. I want it to be really difficult to steer, so I don't need as much surface area. So we ran a model on the keel, and we came up with your typical um, areas of, um, of load that you come out of an FEA model and the bending load. And I said, well, I've got some other problems with this boat. It's always been a pig. And every time it heals, it puts the bow down. So I want to change because 
by putting all that buoyancy at the back, I needed to squash that. So I want to move the bowl, big lead bowl, that was designed for this thing to be the center border, right? So that it was designed so that here we come up. So the bowl was designed right over the center of gravity of the foil, so it lifted up. So I want to move that back to this. All right, so that's a big lump of that's a big lump of uh, lead hanging off the fin. So what I decided to do, and, and actually Phil mentioned about what rocket, it's another part of my life that I I like, um, is trying to make things go incredibly fast in the physical world without real evidence that it works. So one thing that I wanted to model is how much I could twist this thing. All right, and the reason why I want to do that is when we move the bowl back. So we moved all this weight. Back. So, for those that understand riding moment, you know, so as the boat heels over, it got stiffer, so it get faster. Or load in the chain plates, we had to run another model on that, make sure we weren't going to rip the chain plates out of it. But what I wanted to do is do a model to see how much I could twist this thing. And they said, for what? And I said, because I'll get more lift. So, it did two things, right? It, it, we got less surface area, right? It got more flexible. It enabled the fin as the boat heeled over to twist, which gave, gives the boat more lift. So there's a few things going on there. Right? There's a few things going on. So that's where I turn around and say, I trust the FBA because it's giving me what I want. It's giving me a foil that's going to change my, um, my center of buoyancy, but also give me more lift. So that's, um, I thought I'd save that one till, till last because um, that's where I sort of haven't questioned the result other than we pull the boat out after every sail and I keep staring at that little lump of steel that we're machined down to nothing and wondering what's going on. <laughs> so, so yeah, I'll just check that I haven't oh plenty on time. Isn't it? I do all this coloured stuff so I can point it out, but I haven't even read it again. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um yeah. Yes, yeah, so I've gone through the my, my last thing with the uh, with the kilo. There's there's a few different few different variables there. Um, you know, I've spoken to my mate, my new mate at the back, um, talking about what what he does um, in wharf structures, etc. Um, which is is absolutely the destructive and practical practical world. But then when you get to a brand new one like the Piedmont Bridge has been rebuilt recently, and it's um, there's a lot of engineering acumen that goes into doing that. And uh, actually, actually, making sure that um, you know they're not not going to drop half the bridge on top of the walkers underneath. So, yeah. um, so that's me. All right. Well. Uh